Uh, the topic is canopy edge flows, and uh, by uh, canopy, I refer to uh, flow in uh, complex environments. Uh, some people will call it obstructed flows. Uh, it could be um, forests uh, canopy or urban regions, urban canopies. It could be river or stream vegetations. And the environment that I like most recently is the coral reef, uh, uh, which I'm working on uh, in Eilat, in the south uh, tip of Israel. Um, a complex structure is such that we cannot deal with the details. So instead of looking at the uh, fluid mechanics of the flow in between every obstacles, every leaf and every branch, we are applying a volume averaging. So on top of the time averaging that will generate the turbulent flow equations, we will do also a volume averaging, uh, which will basically filter out what we see uh, in between the forest or in between uh, the shrubs or the vegetation. Uh, and we will basically filter it out and generate uh, a continuum description of the flow. And the challenge of what I'm going to present now is how we model this continuum description and with an emphasis on the edge. And um, we are working for a few years already on the different interfaces. Uh, at the beginning, we worked on the upper interface, applying laminar flow uh, uh, regime. Uh, and we were brave enough to dip into the turbulent flow regime. And I'll focus today on, only on the entrance edge. So when the flow is approaching a canopy, it could be a single coral con colony, it could be a single uh, uh, forest patch, and it could be also a shrub. Uh, and I stole some of the images from the conference uh, website to refer to what I'm talking about. How do we do that? We first decompose the four unknown variables, the three velocity components and the pressure, into the time average uh, component and the fluctuating in time. And then we take only the time average and we decompose it into, again, two components. The triangle uh, parenthesis will be volume or spatial averaging, uh, averaging in space. And the deviation from this average will be with a tilde sign. So we end out with the decomposition of the instantaneous local velocity into three components. And we will plug it in into the equations and then do a double averaging in space and time. And we end out with this long equation at the bottom. The equation is basically the same equation as the equation we had before, before we did this double averaging, except for some variables that are new. And we will have to develop closure models in order to replace them. So we have the left-hand side and the first two terms, which are basically replicates of the original terms that we had from the Navier-Stokes equations. <clears throat> but what we have to do now is somehow relate the new terms, the renal stresses, the dispersive stresses, and the drug force, somehow to link it to those four variables that we will solve for when we will do the modeling. So just imagine now that we will be able to develop closure models for those three components. And let's say use um, a top image of the shrub uh, area in Lahavim and try to actually use, as Sally suggested this morning, to use the pattern uh, uh, image and to try to predict, I think it was Sonia who was talking about seed uh, dispersal to predict how the flow will look like and how the transport phenomena will look like, at least on the shrub uh, uh, scale uh, and depending on the problem that we're trying to solve. Basically, the problem was addressed for many years, but mainly in the far downstream area, what some people call the fully developed area. However, nature is not behaving like that, and we heard that yesterday again and again. We have patches, and the flow, basically, if we imagine that we are fluid particles, will go, will penetrate into such an obstructed region, will leave it, will penetrate into a new one, and will leave it, and so forth. So we have a three-dimensional complex uh, uh, phenomena, and we have to address the initial length scales penetrating into each such canopy patch. So this is one example, and I took the liberty to take it from the uh, uh, website. Uh, Another, uh, well, you can't see it, but in agriculture fields, it's the same. Uh, in urban areas, it's the same. 
And as I mentioned earlier today, except for some uh, um, exceptions in Hawaii and Australia, usually coral reefs are not continuous but are made of single patches. And again, the flow, in this case water, will flow, will flow in and out from those areas. So I will skip that. So basically, uh, the edge flow phenomena require special attention. One uh, uh, element uh, very known for the porous media people is the REV, the representative elementary volume that we use to do this volume averaging. Uh, we don't want to have an overlap of length scales. We want to have a separation of scales such that the size of the volume that we use for averaging will be large enough to represent statistically the phenomena on average, but small enough to not to filter out the areas that we would like to model using this macroscopic model. So for example, at the edge, we have a variation of flow of mean velocities, for example, which occur at relatively small scale and there is an overlap of length scales. So we have to address that. Localization is another issue, a little bit more complex, uh, and that refers to the fact that the average itself is also changing with space, especially near the edge. The flow is definitely not one dimensional. In the history, the science history of canopy flow, most of the models deal with the far end, the downstream area, and the model is basically one dimensional. And it's simple, it's relatively simple. It describes some force balance between, let's say, penetration of momentum from the top of the canopy, from above, and the drag force, and that's it. When you are dealing with the ads, you have a three dimensional or two dimensional in uh, some cases, uh, problems and it's definitely not a one dimensional problem anymore so it's much more complex. And the three components, three unknowns, three new variables that we have to address that represent the subscale phenomena, the renal stresses, the dispersive stresses and the drug coefficient or the drug uh, uh, force and I will not address the renal stresses but I will try with the time I have to deal with the drug and the dispersive stresses. I will start with the drug coefficient um, but before that, I would like to uh, explain uh, our method, our tool. And basically, this is an experimental type of, of uh, study. Um, the dream is to have a full description, not a numerical but measured one, of the three-dimensional phenomena in between all the obstacles. Once you have that, you can actually do all the averaging on the measured data, and then compare it to the mean values that you calculate, that you compute from those measured of volume and temporal, temporal averaging of the measured data. And to do that, we're using a, P a PIV, a particle image velocity meter, uh, which is made of two lasers and some optics and a camera. We basically see the flow with tiny particles. You will not be able to see it, I think, in details, but there are t many, many particles here. It looks like... Uh, a uh, desert night uh, without the moonlight with many, many white spots. And basically, I'm going back and forth. We have two lasers and we take uh, image pairs. And the analysis will produce uh, at every location a vector, in this case, a two component vector. And let's say U in the X direction and W in the Z direction. To do that, we uh, create interrogation areas like that. Uh, we have many more, something like 5,500 uh, such squares in a real image, and then we generate uh, such uh, flow field. Once we have that in the three-dimensional area as a function of time and space, we will be able to calculate all the terms and then to try to do uh, some modeling. Uh, in order to do that, we are using a two-dimensional, two-component PIV. We chose to use, we initially started with an array of glass cylinders, which is in a way a little bit limited. Uh, most groups in the world do that. We switch those cylinders into thin glass plates. Uh, this is how it looks from a, uh, from a short distance. Uh, they are vertical, they face the flow, they are seven centimeters uh, height, and they are randomly distributed. Uh, it's a one meter long patch, 40 centimeters wide, and we will concentrate on the entrance, okay? So this is how it looks from above. We have the fully developed region over here, and we will focus on here. The camera looks from the side. You can see the cameras here. And we will have, instead of 25, 25 uh, vertical cross-section, we'll have 
twice 49 vertical cross-sections. Here is one, <coughs> excuse me, one region and then another region. And we have millions of millions of data points here that we basically average to generate the result that I'll show you. So uh, let's begin with, oh, I forgot that. Uh, just for notation, don't look at the table. But here are the four flow rates with the same uh, array, same uh, uh, glass plates array that we're using. We have a Reynolds number changing from 5,000 to almost 50,000. And we'll have some results from the cylinders as well. So P is plates, C is cylinders. This is how the velocity looks like. So imagine you're a fluid particle. You approach a patch like this. You will feel the pressure build up in front of the patch. You will want to, your, your uh, uh, streamlines will want to bypass the patch and go over it. Some of the streamlines will penetrate, will slow down with, uh, with distance, and at the very far area you will have very low velocities with a very significant and important velocity profile that I'm not going to address here. We will focus on the flow here at the entrance to this uh, uh, region. So this is the X component of the momentum equation. If you look at it, almost all the terms are based on velocities, velocities and velocity uh, derivatives. So we have all of them, basically, uh, using the PAV data, except for two. We don't have the pressure, and we don't have the drag force, okay? So we found a way how to bypass the problem, and we basically use the velocity field to calculate the pressure, the pressure field, based on the pressure gradient. Let me show you how, do, how we did that. Once we have doing that, I'll show you how we actually can solve this equation for the drag force and actually get the drag force as a function of location. The very nice thing about it is that we will have it normalized as a function of, let's say, fluid mass. So it's not the force applied on a single tree or a single uh, uh, bush or a single coral. It will be actually the force per unit volume or unit mass in this case. So let's begin with the pressure. Uh, I'll go fast through it. We applied, we decided to assign a value at the left upper corner over here, which will be P equals zero. And then we use the X component uh, momentum equation to calculate the pressure since there is no drag there. It's outside the uh, canopy. So we basically have the, the pressure values here at the top from the PAV measurements. Now we can use the same thing, but now with the vertical momentum equation and basically calculate the pressure uh, in the vertical direction, and since these are thin plates, the um, drag coefficient is extremely small in compare to the horizontal uh, uh, component. So even if we are making there a simple or a small or even a large mistake, the effect on the pressure field will be small, and this is the result, which is ex the expected result. We have just before the pressure, oh, sorry, just before the canopy, we have built up a pressure, so that's the resistance that it's not resistant, but that's the reason the uh, flow will want to bypass the uh, canopy patch. And we have basically the pressure field so we can calculate the PDX and the PDZ and we can continue uh, to go with the uh, drug force. So we are ready to deal with the drug force and let's see what we did. So instead of showing you the drug force per unit mass itself, I'm going to show the drug coefficient. The drag coefficient is basically a tool that we all use in order to calculate the drag force based on the velocity square and a representation of, let's say, the um, geometry or the uh, front area that the flow will meet when it will just approach the canopy. So this is the result that we got from the analysis that I described. So we have here the value of CD, the pressure, co the drag coefficient, as a function of space for one single uh, a flow rate uh, as a function of location. This is exactly what one needs in order to go on and do the modeling uh, and calculate what will be uh, the velocities, the mean velocities in this space. So you can see that there is no drag above the canopy. There is a significant increase, a surprising increase of the drag coefficient that I did not expect, and then a decrease uh, downstream, and there is some higher values that were reported in the fully developed region from numerical solutions. This is one single experiment. Let's look at the four experiments together. So these are vertical cross-sections of the CD value for all four experiments with the plates array, and you can see that just at the entrance, 
we have a lower value, it goes up to a higher values, and then go down again to lower values, and it's quite uniform, except for the bottom, it's quite uniform with depth, so we can apply a depth average. So this is a depth average result of CD as a function of distance, x over age, age is the canopy height, um, and to be honest, I didn't believe those results. When I saw that, uh, I thought that it's too high. Uh, usually what you see in, in modeling is that people uh, assign a constant value, let's say around two, which is a classical value or even lower than that. Um, I saw some, some attempts to do some scaling with the classical uh, plot of CD as a function of Reynolds number for cylinders, but I didn't see any paper using uh, this phenomenon and such high values, and I really uh, was very suspicious and nervous about it. So what we did was to try to measure directly, without all this uh, effort, the uh, force applied on a part of the canopy, part of this glass plates area that uh, we have in, in the flume, in the lab. So we took the flume and we cut basically the faith sorry, the first five centimeters and then the next two and a half centimeters and another five centimeters, and we just hang them on four uh, strings, a very simple experiment. And once we turn on the pump, what will happen is that the, like a swing, the uh, flow will want to uh, take the uh, little part that we hang uh, in the water to the right, to the flow direction, so we very uh, uh, gently uh, with an XY uh, uh, system took it back and lower it down and put it exactly at the same location with something like one and a half millimeter gap in between this isolated part and the other parts of the uh, uh, flume, the, the floor and the other parts of the area. And basically just by the uh, transition, the deflection to the right, this delta X, one can calculate the overall drug force that the flow will apply, will force on uh, this part of the, of, of the area. Um, this is the result. So the blue line is only one of the four experiments, depth average, that we showed before. What we did was to integrate over these five, then 2.5, and then again five centimeters parts, and the red dots are just an integration of the continuous line that was measured, and the green uh, spots are this uh, swing experiments, the weight, hanging weight experiments, and the agreement is, is for me excellent, and the same thing happened with another floor rate. We didn't do the whole four rates, floor, four floor rates. So I'm uh, now convinced that the results are, are reasonable uh, and can be used actually. So I'm not sure about the conclusion whether we can now suggest that we have a model for CD, we don't have that, maybe we need to find a new closure model, maybe the U square closure model for drug force under such environments is not the appropriate one. Because one would like to have a constant which is real constant and not changing with the flow. So that's the drug force story. Let's go into the dispersive stresses, which is a little bit more complicated to explain, but I'll try to do it fast, I hope that you have uh, left some energy to bear with me uh, a few more minutes. So this is how uh, we uh, write mathematically uh, the dispersive stresses. We take, it's basically a correlation between the deviation of the mean velocity in time. So U bar is the mean velocity in time. We will do an average in order to get, in space, in order to get the special average values and the deviation from this volume average is this tilde. So we will do the correlation, the product of U tilde, V tilde, or U tilde, W tilde, it doesn't matter now, or U tilde, U tilde, okay, the uh, autocorrelation, and then we will average it within this REV, we'll average in space. So this is what we are looking for as a function of flow, as a function of array, as a function of location. Let me explain how we do that. So it will, I think, explain itself uh, when I'm showing it. So I will look at the cylinders uh, uh, case, I will look from the top, it will be a horizontal uh, flow field, so that's the reason I'm talking about U and V and not U and W. And this is what you see when you are running the PAV results. So you have a transient, an instantaneous series of instantaneous velocity maps, and this is the subscale phenomenon. The first thing will be to average it in time. So this is the average result of the flow field in time. 
but nobody has the details of where every leaf and every branch has, so you have to, over, to average this in space as well. So this is the result, very boring. But now we lost most of the physics, okay? So we need now to address the deviation, the difference between this value and what we saw before, and this is the difference between the mean velocity in space and time and the mean velocity in time only. And now what we need to do is to average this in space again, and we will generate only one single number in the center of this REV, in the center of this volume. So this is what I'm going to show as a, as a function of different parameters. Um, don't look at everything. What we are showing here is two plots in the entrance and a plot at the downstream area. Um, these are the dispersive and renal stresses. We have six components. The renal stresses don't have the symbols, so these are here at the top, U, U, UW, and WW in a vertical cross-section. Uh, and here at the bottom, we have the uh, uh, plots or the curves with the symbols. So these are the dispersive stresses, and this is the focus of uh, this part of the presentation. In the downstream area, you see that all the lines, this is a function of height, uh, don't have the bullets, don't have those dots, don't have the symbols except for uh, the curves in the center, which means that the value of the dispersive stresses are indeed negligible. All the models that I found that do pure modeling using this approach ignore basically their dispersive stresses, which is absolutely correct when you do it in the far downstream area. But in the entrance area, what we will focus now is on the blue curve with the dots. This is the u tilled u tilled values, which is very large, larger than everything else, at the top of the canopy and at 0 0.3 of the height, so towards the bottom of the canopy. And again, in both cases, under the condition that we measured, the dispersive stresses component u tilled u tilled is the largest. So if you ignore it, you definitely are going to make a mistake. But to be sure, one has to see how it will affect the momentum equation. So this is the next, and I think almost the last slide, uh, not the last slide, but the last uh, topic, or well, last before, the one before last topic. Uh, we will focus on the um, magnitude of this component as compared to the other components. So just one slide. Again, we will not focus on everything. Look at the lower part alone. You see that all the values at the downstream, x over h, the canopy height, very far from the entrance, almost everything is relatively small. Uh, the dispersive stresses component in the momentum equations are also very small. But let's look what's happening at the entrance. We will focus on the green, uh, green line with the bullets, the u tilde, u tilde component in the momentum equation. It has negative values at the beginning, then it suddenly has a positive value, and then it disappears. Negative values act like uh, resistance, like the drug force, where, where we have the pressure and the inertia on the positive side. So physically, the dispersive stresses are basically a momentum sink at the beginning. The velocity is very high, so it takes some momentum from the free flow, and then it becomes a source of momentum and then it disappears. But in the, let's say, first two length scales, it is very important. So if you have a square uh, shrub, then, then probably it will be uh, effective and important throughout the uh, flow field within such a single shrub. It's not enough to convince uh, people that it is important. One has to offer closure models. Um, we saw that in the drug force, it's an issue. One has to modify or find an equation that will describe uh, the uh, drag coefficient. Here again, one has to link somehow the dispersed stresses that describe the subscale phenomena with the mean velocities, okay? Either U or W, but mean in time and in space. And we succeeded to do that for this single uh, uh, flow scenario. Without going into the details, it's too late now. Uh, the uh, model is based on the shape or the relatively area of the wakes generated by the obstacles. This is something that has to be provided to the model. And the result is quite a good fit between the model and the measurements. The continuous lines 
are the model, the uh, symbols are for the measurements. Here we have the less important downstream, fully developed result for the four different uh, flow scenarios. And this is for two cases. On the left side, we have... I don't see it. Well, I'll look at it here. The measured uh, values are on the left column, so this one and this one, and the modeled one will be on the right side here and here, and we have uh, one experiment here at the top. This is the low velocity, low Reynolds number, and this is the high Reynolds number. So we have a model, and it, nicely enough, the coefficients that we are using are basically the same in space, in the vertical direction, um, they are changing with respect to x distance, but they are the same for the four uh, different flow rates. I bet that if we are using a different array, they will be also, uh, they will have to be changed as well. To conclude, um, I didn't show it in details, uh, but the advective terms are high and have to be considered when you are at the inlet part of the uh, canopy patch. The drag coefficient is unfortunately far from being constant and uh, applying a value, uh, assigning a value of two or one point something uh, as a constant value is definitely, uh, uh, does not represent reality. Dispersive stresses must be uh, considered and uh, included in the modeling. Uh, and I didn't show the Reynolds stresses, but the Reynolds stresses uh, picture is, is complex and interesting. Um, however, in some scenarios, one can use the more traditional uh, um, um, modeling approach uh, to renal stresses, uh, while in other cases, uh, one cannot do that. Thank you very much. It's time for questions. Three? Yep. If I can, about, uh, so a couple of things. Uh, so I, I agree with your comments about the dispersive stresses. I think, you know, that's, that's well taken. The, the thing is, if you, um, uh,